Good morning, Life Spring. Good morning. So happy Easter to you. Happy Easter. He's risen. He is risen. <laughs> He's risen. He is risen indeed. He's risen. He is risen indeed. I do that just for Larry. <laughs> It's great to see you all. It's great to be able to get together and celebrate Easter together. One of the things that uh, I think of Easter is uh, injustice. And I, it goes back to when I was 14 years old. I was a teenager. I just became a Christian. And my friend, my mentor, my, the guy who was discipling me was just hounding me to get to start reading the Bible. And so he said, just start in Matthew and read a chapter a day. And so I started in Matthew and I read a chapter a day finally under the peer pressure. And when I got to the story of the cross, I was like, this is just wrong. What, what's happening to this man was just awful. And, and it just triggered in me this anger, this heat. That's like, well, this is just wrong. And I realized this about myself, that I have a real problem with injustice. It is one of my triggers. If you want to get me riled up, if you want to get me all hot and heavy, it will be about injustice. I remember back in middle school, long time ago, middle school, there were a few kids acting up in class. And of course, I was not one of them, right? But they were acting up in class and the teacher was getting heated and hot. And finally, she punished the whole class for the sake of a few. And she gave us a writing assignment. This is middle school and she assigned us 10 pages writing assignment. Now I hate writing, so that was even worse for me. But get this, it was over Easter break. It was over that, that holiday, and my family was taking a camping trip. And now my camping trip was going to be spent writing these worthless pages of writing that I knew the teacher was never going to read. And I was so frustrated. I remember complaining to my parents, but it was back in the day where parents backed the teacher. Remember that far ago? It was the teacher was always right, and you were always wrong. And so just write your assignment. Just get it done. And I was like, I was just ready to scream. It just seemed so unjust. And, and that was just a little thing. A lot of you have had experiences way worse than that. I, I'm absolutely sure women, I'm sure you've experienced some things. And I'm sure based on skin color in this room, you've had some biases and some injustices, some things that you've had to deal with as well. And it just, it just feels so wrong. And believe it or not, that is the story of Easter. It, it is the story of injustice. It has to be. At least on the human side, it's all about injustice. And so I want to I wanna take a, a bit of a break today. And I want to march through with some kangaroo courts. Because Jesus is going to be marched through the court system in a 12-hour period. He, he's going to be rushed through the uh, judicial system there that they had, and they're going to do the whole thing in less than 12 hours, and they're going to convict him and sentence him to capital punishment, and it's absolutely amazing. It, it never possibly could happen anywhere else by any other group than this group right here. It was, it was, it was obscene and horrific, and, and, and it's just, it, it's a horror but it happened. And I want you to understand that it happened to Jesus. And this is really important. We got to understand that Jesus was the ultimate victim of injustice that ever was. There's, there, there, there's a lot of injustice out there, but I don't think anybody, anybody has any competition going with what happened with Jesus. Because what happened to him was absolutely absurd and crazy, but it happened. So, so let's look. Let, let's look at the three kangaroo courts, and let's just remember what happened on the human side of Easter. So I want to start in Matthew 26. This is the first court. This is the Sanhedrin. So he jumps right to the highest court of the land. So when, when, when you think of Sanhedrin, you should think Supreme Court. But they didn't have seven or nine or 11. They had 71 individuals that resided on the Supreme Court, and they're gathered together. Together. We're going to pick it up in Matthew 26, verse 57. So those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teacher of the law and the elders has assembled. Now, we got to get the picture here because this is so wrong on so many levels. This is after midnight. So you got to think, what would typical family life where they didn't have late night TV... They, they, they didn't have their phones to be catching up on YouTube or whatever. When the sun went down, it was pretty much bedtime. 
That's just, it was a farming, agricultural kind of community. And so they didn't have a nightlife. But yet they're able to gather 71 rulers and elders of Israel at Caiaphas' house after midnight. Why? Isn't it sound a little bit convenient? Pre-planned? Because it is. So they assemble at Caiaphas' house. 71 elders are able to meet. And, and get this, we have a hard time getting a group of six together for a committee on any day of the week. But they're able to get 71 men together in Caiaphas' house because they're seriously motivated. They want to kill this man. And, and they have the man. <laughs> they, they've arrested the man, but they just don't have a crime yet. And so they're looking for something to convict him on. So the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for what? For false evidence against Jesus. So what's the outcome thereafter? So they could put him to death. And what's so horrific about this is, is we don't even understand the culture of the day and why this is so wrong. So under Jewish law, you could not try, try anyone after dark. And it was because it was because capital crimes were so severe, people's lives are on the line. <laughs> so they had to be above board. They had to be in the light of day so everybody could see. So there was a sense of accountability. So everything was done right. And so they're trying a man, first of all, at night, at midnight. <laughs> and the other rule was it had to be done. Capital crimes had to be tried in the temple during the day. And it was again, so there would be plenty of eyes. The whole public could see what was going on so they could ensure that everything was done reasonably well and like it should be done by the letter of the law. Because again, it's somebody's life. But they're meeting in the cloak of darkness at Caiaphas' house away from the public and they've already decided this guy is guilty. We just got to figure of what? We got to figure out what he's guilty of. And so they're looking for any false witness, any false evidence, anything they can basically kill this guy for. And they have a problem. Verse 60, but they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. They had no problem coming up with liars. Many liars were willing to come up and perjure themselves and give false witness against this man. But the problem is that they still had to have the semblance of being legit. And in Jewish system, you had to have two or more agree. You had to have two or more say the same thing, give the same testimony. And with all the liars they gathered, they couldn't get two to agree until finally two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild build it in three days that doesn't sound like much of a crime though and so Caiaphas the high priest is getting frustrated and there's tension in the room because we've got to kill this guy why do you think they feel they have to kill this guy what, what, what was the problem with Jesus well, Pilate's going to say it's jealousy, and he's close. It is a, there's a lot of jealousy here. There's envy because Jesus is incredibly popular. He's just come in riding on a donkey, and they hail him as king. They, they, there is this jealousy. There's this, this slipping away of power. It's a lot about power. It's a lot about control. And these are the rulers, and they're feeling their power ebb away. <laughs> and there's this jealousy, and so they just hate Jesus because he's this upstart. And he's displacing them. So they finally get two witnesses to agree, but Caiaphas realizes this isn't enough. So in absolute frustration, he's like, are you not going to answer? So the high priest stood there and he said, because Jesus is just silent through this whole thing. In fact, you'll see that is pretty much what he does through all three trials is he pretty much doesn't say much, if anything at all. And here he's just silent. All these accusers come forward, all these liars, and he knows they're lying and he just, he just lets them lie. And then finally Caiaphas says, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But again, Jesus remains silent. Until then, until the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. That goes, that's a, that's a, a legal thing that's going on. It is, it, is, it is a binding thing on Jesus that you are compelled to speak and what you speak must be the truth. So finally, Jesus does speak now after being charged. Tell us 
if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Tell us if you really are the Messiah, the Son of God. And this is just a trap. And Jesus now compelled to speak, he does speak, and he says, you have said so. Mark adds something here. Mark, if you go to Mark's gospel, he's going to have this little two-word answer, I am. And that's powerful. If you know the Old Testament in the name of God, Yahweh means I am. And so Jesus claims to be God here, but he claims, he goes on, he says, from now on, you will see me. You will see the son of man. Son of man is his, his special way of referring to himself when he talked about himself. You will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one, sitting at the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven, which is the clouds are a symbol of God. Always through the Old Testament, it means God's presence. So he's coming with God's presence. So he's saying, hey, yeah, if there ever was an anointed one, if there ever was the Messiah, I'm him. Because I'm going to be sitting at the right hand of power right next to God. And I will be coming with God in judgment and power. It's, it's just a matter of time, but that is going to happen. And so Jesus makes this incredible claim. Well, <laughs> this is enough. This is what they were looking for. Then the high priest tore his clothes because this is one of the few cases of high priest was allowed to tear his clothes when blasphemy was taking place. And so the priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Now it's only blasphemy. <laughs> it's only technically blasphemy if Jesus is lying. <laughs> you see, if Jesus really is the Messiah, if Jesus really is the son of God, it's not blasphemy at all. He's still not guilty of anything, but they assume that there's no way this guy could be the son of God, that this guy could be the promised one, the Messiah. So he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And so they take a vote amongst the 70 there, and he is worthy of death, they determine. And so Jesus is convicted. And he's charged, and now he needs to die. We finally got the crime. We had the guy. Now we have the crime, but there's still a problem. You see, under the laws, under the, the rules now that Rome is in charge and over everything, the Jews are not allowed to kill anybody by capital punishment. Only Rome can. Now, the Jews will break that, that law periodically. Like you, if you know your, old, your New Testament, you know that they killed Stephen soon after this. They stoned him. Well, that wasn't allowed, but they did it anyway. They were so irate and so out of control. They, they just do it on the spot. But here they're going to try to go through the system, and they know they can't now kill Jesus, so they have to bring him to Pilate. And so the next stage tonight, now remember this is all happening one or two o'clock in the morning and they're moving him through the system. And so now the Sanhedrin has convicted him of blasphemy and says he needs to die. And so they bring him to Pilate. And it's not really the full trial yet, so we'll skip Pilate for a bit. But, but Pilate's going to see, he's going to see through what the elders, the, the Jews are up to, and he's going to see their jealousy, and he's going to see that Jesus really has not done anything wrong, at least nothing worthy of death. And so he wants to release him. But that's the thing. Everybody that sees Jesus is guiltless, that he's truly innocent, they don't have the courage to do what's right. And that's often the case, is it not? That, that, that's often why injustice takes place, as people see it's wrong, but they're not willing to step up and say it's wrong. And that's true for Pilate. Pilate's going to see Jesus should not die, but, but he's worried about the political implications of fighting the Jews. And so he tries to pass the buck. And so what he's going to do, since he's between a rock and a hard place, between the Jews and Caesar, he's, he's going to pass Jesus off for his second trial. What he's going to discover is he's going to discover that Jesus is a Galilean. He's from Galilee. And so he's not in charge of Galilee. And so he's going to pass him off and say, this is not my jurisdiction. So we pick this up in Luke. This is the second, second kind of uh, trial. On hearing this, Pilate asked the man 
uh, asked if the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, now this is King Herod, not, not, not Herod the great, Herod Antipas is now this Herod. He's the king. Uh, he has Herod, he has jurisdiction. So he sent him now to Herod's place. And Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at the time because it was the Passover. So he sends Jesus over and he's, he's basically, oh, I finally got that off my hand. That was a hot potato. He's gone. I'm going to send him over to Herod, Herod and he's going to appreciate this. And sure enough, Herod does. Herod gets really excited. So when Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased. He's pumped about this because for a long time, he had been wanting to see Jesus. He's heard all these incredible stories, all these miracles and all these, these incredible stories about his wise teaching. He's like, wow, great. I finally get to meet this guy from what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He's hoping for a magic show is really what's going on here, right? He's, he's hoping to take in some of these wonders Jesus is famous for. And so he's really excited about it. And so the accusers have to go with him. So this delegation from the Sanhedrin, I hope not all 70 are there, but, but they traipse over with him to Herod's place and they basically try Jesus in the middle of the night before Herod. So they get Herod out of bed. He, he comes forward. He's kind of excited though because it's Jesus. He's heard so much about him. And then the accusers say, hey, he's guilty. He's guilty. He's guilty. And they go on and on and on about their stuff. And Herod's realizing as well, this guy's not guilty. <laughs> but he's hoping to see some magic tricks. So he plied him with many questions, but Jesus does what Jesus does through his trials. He gives no answer whatsoever. And so Herod's incredibly disappointed. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him and Herod and his soldiers then ridiculed him. So this, this, is, this all started with Herod, this dress up game with Jesus. You notice they, they put him in a royal robe and, and mock him as king of the Jews. Actually, that wasn't pilot soldiers. They, they, didn't, they didn't come up with that. That was Herod. And so his soldiers dressed him up in an elegant robe, mocked him as the king. And then basically Herod says, I don't want to deal with this either. I, I, I don't want to touch this. This is, this is not good for politics. It's not good for Rome. And, and, and it's not good to be caught like this with the Jews because it's already so much civil unrest here. And he's like, no, I'm sending you back to Pilate. So Jesus is passed around like a hot potato. Nobody wants to touch this thing. They know it's wrong, but they, they refuse to deal with it. And so Pilate gets Jesus back. And I'm sure he's depressed about that. And that's where we jump to John 19 for the third kangaroo court. So Pilate has already talked to Jesus once. He's, he's heard the Jews out. He's, he understands that they want him dead, but he doesn't see the reason why. And so Pilate thinks he's going to placate the Jews. I'll, I'll make them happy by beating him. He's not worthy of being beaten, but I'll beat him just to, just to get the Jews off my back. And so they have Jesus flogged. And it's, it's, it's the lesser. There's three levels of flogging in Rome. And this was the lowest one, the fustigatio. And it was, a, it was a means of punishment. I mean, it hurt, but it wasn't like what he's going to get later. It's bad. It's, it's one of those beatings that is, that is designed to teach you a lesson so you don't do it again. But it's, you're meant to live through it. And so he's beaten. And then his praetorian guard there seizes on the robe that Herod has given Jesus and they take it a step further. They give him another thing to add to the ensemble and they make him a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they put that robe back on him, that purple robe, and they mock him as king. And Herod brings him out to the crowd this way, hoping that the Jews will see that Jesus has been mocked. He's been humiliated. He's, he's been brought low and he's been beaten. He's been punished. This should be enough. So once more, because he's brought him out multiple times, it's going to be like four times he brings him out. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. The man's not guilty. But I, for good measure, I've beaten him and humiliated him. And so when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here's the man. And, and he's... Jesus is, is close to unrecognizable. Remember the Sanhedrin, when they were done, they put a blindfold on him and beat him in the face, punched him in the face, and told him to prophesy who hit him next. 
Then, now, he's been beat on the back by, by the garrison with the fustigatio, and then, and then put that crown of thorns is jammed on his head. And so his, his face is difficult. I've, he's, got, he's got black eyes. He's probably got a broken nose. He's, he, he's a mess. He's all swollen, and he's been beaten down, and, and, and he's dressed in this purple robe, and he has this crown on, and Pilate's hoping that will be enough. You can let me off the hook, Jews. Here is the man. And as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. You handle it. But they know they can't. <laughs> the, the law doesn't allow them to kill Jesus on their own. And so the Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to the law, he must die. And they're talking about blasphemy, because blasphemy was a capital crime. He claimed to be the son of God, and so he must die. Well, Pilate doesn't want to do this. When Pilate heard this, notice what it says. He was even more afraid. So this, this is a bad thing for Pilate. I, I kind of feel for Pilate. He's caught between a rock and a hard place here. He's playing this political game where his life is on the line here, and we don't understand it. So, so the Jews are this incredible force. He's supposed to keep civil order there amongst the Jews, and they're constantly revolting. They're constantly calling strifes. There's these zealots that are, that are doing terrorist attacks around the place, and, and there's all this pockets of unrest that he has to deal with. And so he's already in a, in, in, in a desperate situation, and he wants to placate the Jews, but he doesn't want to be unjust either. He doesn't want to kill this man if he doesn't have to. But they just told him what? He's the son of God. He claims to be the son of God. Now, that's totally lost on us in the West. In our, in our modern culture where we're so engrossed in science, that totally just like, whew. not for Pilate, though. We got to understand, remember, Pilate was raised in a polytheistic culture where, where, where you have this whole pantheon of gods. And these gods are mean-spirited, uh, just vindictive kind of gods. You didn't want to mess with the gods. In fact, in fact you, you wanted to avoid the gods' attention in that culture. In fact, a lot of the religious system was to just keep the gods away. You wanted to placate gods. Because once they got involved, it didn't end well for people. And so what does he hear? He hears Jesus is the son of God. And they believed in that stuff. Hercules was the son of God, right? All of these heroes were titans, were, were half men, half gods. And so Pilate hears this and he says, uh-oh. That's why he says Pilate heard this and he was even more afraid. Because he's like, uh oh, now I'm messing with the gods. And you don't mess with the gods. It doesn't end well for anybody. This is bad news. And on top of it, Pilate gets a note from his wife. Remember, this is happening in the middle of the night. And so she's sleeping through this. And she's woken up by this terrible dream. And in this terrible dream, she's saying, she's being told. She has this premonition. Stay away from this man. This is dangerous. And so she sends this note to Pilate saying, hey, whatever's going on here, whatever this man is, stay away from it. I've had this premonition. This is bad. And sure enough, it is bad. <laughs> so Pilate now is, is now caught in a bigger degree than he thought he was. Before it was just, how do I placate the Jews? But now I've got the gods on this side, and I don't want to get anybody angry. If this is God's son, I'm getting into a whole heap of trouble, or I'm fixing to, and this is bad. And he doesn't know what to do. And so he resolves, he, he finally makes this internal decision and says, okay, I'm not going to kill this guy. So... He goes back and he interviews Jesus. And he went back inside the palace and he asked Jesus, where do you come from? Where do you come from? Mount Olympus? Where, where do you come from? And, and he asked Jesus, but Jesus again gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Which is kind of ironic when you think about it. Because here's the judge of all the universe. And this little... Little judge of this area in Judea, right? And granted, he had power in Judea, but he's talking to the one that God has put in charge of all judgment. The judge of all judges. 
(laughs) And he's saying, I have power over you. Don't you realize it? I have power either to free you or to crucify you. Kind of, kind of ironic. Jesus answered, this is again, one of those rare times he spoke back. He said, you would have no power over me if it wasn't given to you from above. Because that's what the Bible teaches about all authority. It all flows from God. And therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And Judas, wow. The judgment on Judas is great. But he's not just talking about Judas. He's talking about the whole Sanhedrin here. Because they're the ones that handed him over to Pilate. Their sin, their their guilt is greater. He's not saying Pilate's off the hook here, but he is saying, hey, comparatively, these guys have it way worse than you. And so Pilate makes his choice. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. And I believe he really did try. I I believe he earnestly tried to do everything within his power, played all the political games he could to set Jesus free because he's scared to death. He's scared of death of the gods. He's scared to death of the Jews, and he doesn't want to be caught up in this mess. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Talk about political intrigue here. This is a threat. We, we, we don't see it as a threat because we don't understand the politics of the region, but this is a threat. You see, we're not told this, but Pilate is already in the hot seat with Rome. And Rome is ruled by a guy named Tiberius Caesar, who is known to be very paranoid and, and very vindictive. He, he, loved, he loved to punish people, and he loved to punish people brutally. And when you got on the bad side of Tiberius, you were in a really seriously bad place. And some things had happened in Jerusalem, some, some uprisings, and Pilate was already got some warnings from Rome. And the Jews knew it. And so, so they're playing the Caesar card. And Tiberius Caesar was a guy you should be afraid of. And so Pilate's on one side has the gods. (laughs) I don't want to mess with the gods. I don't want to kill an innocent man. My wife is warning me away. But the Jews are on the other side and they're saying, if you don't kill him, we're ratting you out to Caesar is really what they're saying. You're no friend of Caesar and Caesar's going to hear about it. And so everything changes after this. Notice what it says next. And when Pilate heard this, He brought Jesus out, sat down on the judge's seat at the place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. And if you ever go to the the Holy Lands, this is one of the places you should go. The pavement is still there. It's a big, huge stone patio. And in the center of it is a chair, the judgment seat, at which the judge would sit to pronounce judgment. And that's what he's doing. That's why he's he's making a show of it. He's going down the pavement, sitting in the chair because he's going to pronounce judgment on Jesus because he feels like he has no choice. He's caught between a rock and a hard place. And he's realizing it's either my life or Jesus's life, my family or Jesus. And he feels politically he doesn't have a choice. The Jews have put him in that tight spot that he can't see a way out of. And he doesn't have the courage to say, this is just plain wrong, regardless. So it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. So remember, this started about midnight. Now it's noon. It's took, taken 12 hours to march through all these courts, these three kangaroo courts. And Pilate, at this point, he's furious. Right? He, he resents the Jews in a big way because the Jews are pressuring him. And they're making him do what he doesn't want to do. And so he taunts them. He, he starts pushing their buttons. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. <laughs> but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Because again, he's pushing their button. He's, he knows he's really not their king, but he's going to keep pushing that button. In fact, he's going to make a placard above the cross saying Jesus is the king of the Jews because he knows it really irritates them because he's really angry at the Jews right now. And notice how the Jews respond. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. And finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Now he's going to wash his hands and say the guilt is on them and all of that stuff, but... The decision was still Pilate's. He could have said no, but he 
didn't feel like he could say no. And for political reasons, even Pilate realized this. I believe Herod realized this. And I believe the Sanhedrin realized this because they were looking for a crime and had to make something up. Jesus was an innocent man. And in the process, they're going to beat him one more time, get him ready for the cross. And now this is the serious beating, the verberatio. It was, it was designed that if left afterwards, you would, you would more than likely die just from the beating. Forget about the cross. And that's why Jesus is dead in less than three hours. He dies at three in the afternoon after a short time on the cross. It's why he can't carry the cross beam to the cross and they have to get Simon the Cyrene to help him carry it. He's, he's going to be beaten three times, once by the Sanhedrin, twice by the Praetorian guy, but the third time was the big one. And they're going to mock him again. They're going to, they're going to take that crown of thorns and that, that robe off and beat him, but then put that robe back on and they're going to give him one more prop. They're going to give him a reed this time, a mock scepter and make fun of him as king of the Jews and then take him out to the cross and kill him. And he's innocent. This is one of the greatest injustices in all of history. Political expediency, it's about power, it's about jealousy, but it's not, it's not justice. And that's what I want you to see. This is not justice. In this world, I don't think we get justice, really. I, I, I know we strive for it. We try to put systems of courts in place that, that are meant to try to get justice. But there's, there's, there's just, there's a semblance of justice, but it's rare. And I, I hate to say that, but I believe that's true. But the good thing in all of this is this. While we are doing our worst, in this case, this was humanity's worst, God is doing something better. That while we're being unjust, God is actually working out a system of justice. He's actually doing something incredible behind the scenes. So even when things are unjust, this is the thing we need to realize God is just. So we have a friend in Jesus. He totally gets it. If you ever, ever a victim of injustice, he totally understands. He, he's somebody you can go to, somebody you can relate. There's nobody who's been through the ringer of injustice like he has been. But the good news is that God doesn't go for injustice. He, he, he's not like us. He's not weak. He's, he's not going to play the political games. He's, he's not going to feel the pressure. He's, he's not going to be placating anyone. God's going to do what's right regardless because he is just. And in the midst of all of this injustice, God is doing something that is just. And that also is the story of Easter. One of the hard truths... That, that is so hard to hear as human beings is this one in Romans, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But that's just a reality. That's truth. If you ever have kids, you can see it right at the earliest age. There's something in us that's broken. There's something that in us is selfish. There's something that's in us is, that's proud. There's something in us that wants to control things and is greedy and lustful and dishonest. There is this brokenness in every human being. And that's why everything we touch ends up being broken. We, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's just the truth. And it's hard to embrace it, but it's true. And the Bible also says, well, there's consequences for that, right? For the wages of sin, this, 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 this brokenness in us is death. And he doesn't mean just that we're going to die. He means that everybody's destined to die once, but we're destined to die once. And then the judgment is what the Bible tells us. So there's this, there's this thing after death. There's this thing called hell and consequences with God. And the typical wage, the, the standard punishment for sin is death. Everlasting punishment. And again, that's a hard message. But that's why this but here is so important. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So in the midst of this injustice... God's doing something just, but it's not just just. It's loving, it's gracious, it's kind, it's merciful. It's, it's a gift that he's trying to give us a way out. 
He's trying to give us a just means of being forgiven. He's trying to give us a just way of getting out from underneath our problem because he has to be just. He has to be the just judge. And so he offers us a way out. And First Peter <laughs> says it wonderfully well. For Christ also suffered once for sins. And hopefully you see today, he did suffer. He was a victim of incredible injustice. And it's because he was innocent, because he truly was the son of God. And he, as an innocent man, suffered, but he suffered in our place. Jesus basically said, I'll die for everybody else. The, the ones who deserve it, because that's what it goes next. The righteous, he was the righteous one, by the way. The righteous for the unrighteous, and that's us. We're not right with God. Things are broken. We have sin. The wages of sin is death. And so we are the unrighteous. We're not right with God. But he did this to bring you to God. And that's the incredible message of Easter. That in the midst of injustice, God is trying to give you a just means. So your sins are still punished, but they're punished on somebody else. So that you can have a path to God. So you can know God and have that restored relationship with him. Be forgiven, escape that judgment, all of that. Have eternal life. But there's Easter. He was put to death. He was put to death in the body. And that's Good Friday. That's the injustice. He was put to death in the body. But now here comes Easter. But made alive in the spirit. And that's Sunday morning. Because he didn't stay dead. The spirit came, rejuvenated him, gave him life, brought him back from death right? And the grave. And he was alive again. He was alive again. And this all happened to bring you to God. So every single one of us could have a restored relationship with God. And that says a lot about God because God so loved you that he gave his son and had him die an unjust death. So God could justly say, you are forgiven. You are justified. You are my son. You are my daughter. Enter into the kingdom. And it's incredible news. And this is how anyone, absolutely anyone, can participate in that good news. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and that's the big Lord, that's God. If you'll confess Jesus is God and believe in your heart, Believe in the depths of your soul and heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. If you, will, if you can get to the place where you genuinely believe that Jesus is God and believe that he rose again from the grave, salvation is ours. And anybody can embrace Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And my, and my advice is take it. Take it. Because this is the best deal ever. It's just because, yes, somebody paid the price for the sins that you have committed and that you will commit. But it doesn't have to be you that pays the price. And you can embrace Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And you can be forgiven. And you can be set free. And now you can have joy. And you can have peace. And you can have this purpose and meaning. You can have all the things of what Jesus called the fullness, the fullness of God. That's Easter. So injustice, then God comes and inserts justice and gives us a way to have a relationship with him because Jesus rose again from the grave. Why did Jesus rise from the grave? Because he had to prove that what he said was true. He, he had to come back to life because he said that's what was going to happen. He had to come back to life to validate, to, in a sense, prove the path. He had, God had to say, yes, this is legitimately my son. Let me show you and raise him from the grave. Yes, he is the sacrifice for his sin. Let me prove it. Let me raise him from the grave. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Let me prove it to you. Let me give him some life. And raise him from the grave. And so Easter had to come because he had to not only be put to death in the body, but be made alive by the Spirit. 
And that's Easter. That's what we get to celebrate. It's God's justice in a sense. God intervening in the world and ensuring there's justice, even though we were doing our worst to ensure there wasn't any justice. And he provided this way, this path, this perfect path, this perfect sacrifice, so we could have forgiveness and have Christ in our life and be set free and forgiven and have life. And my advice is latch onto that, go for that, desperately seek after that. You want that because that's life. Let's pray. Lord, we do praise you this morning. We thank you for Easter because he has risen and you rose him from the grave. You gave him life. You proved to the world that he really was what he said he was. It wasn't blasphemy. (laughs) It wasn't even close to blasphemy. He really was the son of God and you proved it to the whole world. You raised him from the grave and we're here to celebrate it today. And Lord, if there's anybody here who hasn't stepped over that line of faith yet, Lord, give them the faith they need to believe, to believe that you are the Lord and that God did raise you from the grave. And Lord, just do that work, that miraculous work inside their heart and soul and set them free. And forgive them of their sins. And give them life. Lord, thank you for your mercy and grace. But also thank you that you are just. That in the end, you're going to put everything right. And this is just part of the process. You being just, even when we were unjust. And so Lord, bless us today, Lord. Help us to be able to celebrate Celebrate what you endured for us, but also celebrate the life now we have in you, thanks to your sacrifice. Help us to be vibrantly alive, to be excited about what you've done for us, and celebrate victoriously, because you have done a great thing and given us life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.